The new day breaks with very conflicting information about the situation in Bakhmut. According to some reports, not just Ukrainian reports, but Russian reports as well, the Ukrainian military carried out some kind of a counterattack in the area of the main railway station in Bakhmut, and they regained some ground, and the railway station remains contested. Other reports say that the counterattack did indeed take place and that it failed to achieve any gains at all. Still other reports deny that there was a counterattack. This is one of those situations where observing these events from far away in London, one has to simply and straightforwardly admit that I just don't know what the answer to those, uh, to, to the reality or non-reality of this counterattack is, and whether it did in fact achieve anything of any importance. I'm going to say, however, that all the indications, nonetheless, remain that whatever the effects of this counterattack, assuming it did take place, even if it did achieve some minor gains. I'm confident that those minor gains will be reversed and the Russians will continue their gradual, remorseless capture of Bakhmut. There's just been a long article about the battle in Bakhmut in Bild Zeitung, German tabloid newspaper, but a journalist has reported to Bild Zeitung about the situation in Bakhmut. He speaks about a continuing Russian advance in the town and about the Ukrainian soldiers in Bakhmut increasingly questioning, or rather perhaps not increasingly because they've been doing this for some time, but questioning the logic of continuing to defend a town, Bakhmut, and suffering extremely heavy losses in doing so, a town which the Russians are certain to capture. Nonetheless, that is what Ukraine continues to do, and by some reports, something like 35% of the Ukrainian military is concentrated, not just in Bakhmut itself and the immediate areas around about, but in what might be called the adjoining territory, making up a force of something like 90,000 men, all operating in some way, in trying to keep at least parts of Bakhmut under Russian control or to prolong this battle for as long as possible. And I would say that there's been another report, this time from RT, a Russian, obviously a Russian agency. They've described the fighting in Bakhmut. I'm not going to discuss what they say. They give various accounts of the state of the fighting, but they put the number of Ukrainian forces in and around Bakhmut. They give the same number as I've done in the past, around 30,000 men, and I think this is probably the totality of the Ukrainian forces that are immediately involved defending this small place which originally had a population of 75,000. Now, when I say 30,000 men, obviously there's constant reinforcement, men die, men are replaced, but it is 30,000 men in total that are fighting both in Bakhmut and in the areas round about. Anyway, that is my understanding of the totals. Now, the Russians have, in addition, made a number of statements about the progress of the fighting in Bakhmut. And um, we've had a comment about the fighting there from the Russian Defense Ministry. And um, this was been made by Lieutenant General Igor Konoshenkov, who is the Russian Defense Ministry spokesman. He says, in the Donetsk direction, the Wagner assault teams continue highly tense combat operations for ousting the enemy from the central quarters of the city. Russian airborne forces are providing support uh, 
um, for the Wagner assault teams on the flanks. In particular, they are blocking the redeployment of Ukrainian army reserves to the city and the enemy's retreat from Bakhmut. During the last 24 hours, um, Aircraft of the Russian Aerospace Forces have flown 12 sorties to provide support for the combat teams in Bakhmut, whilst missile troops and artillery accomplished 57 firing objectives. Now, note those words that um, the uh, Russian, uh, that the Russian um, airborne forces the paratroopers, um, are blocking the redeployment of Ukrainian army reserves to the city, to Bakhmut, and preventing the enemy's retreat. And there's been a similar statement from Jan Gagin, the um, advisor of um, the... Uh, uh, of Denis Pushilin, who's the head of the Donetsk people, a regional government. And this is what he's reported to have said on Russia 24 television channel earlier today. The enemy has been edged out to the western outskirts, outskirts of Bakhmut. Uh, he actually says Artyomovsk, but I will call it Bakhmut. And fierce battles are now raging there. The Ukrainian combat group itself has now been blocked, almost sealed off. The Ukrainian military has no possibility to retreat along uh, roads because all of them are practically controlled by Russian artillery. The Ukrainian military's attempts to deliver food and ammunition to its troops and rotate the personnel currently fighting in Bakhmut are doomed to fail, although such attempts are regularly made. Um, Kiev's counteroffensive in the area will, will fail due to insufficient reserves, the absence of equipment for its delivery, and also due to the preparedness of Russian forces. The enemy group in Bakhmut is deprived of its logistic support. Actually speaking, the enemy now faces the choice, as I said before, either death or capture. Well, that's Gagin. That was Konoshenkov. I'm not absolutely sure that they're telling us anything there which we don't already know, that the Russians are able to shell the roads to um, attack any Ukrainian vehicles moving up and down the roads into Bakhmut, and this has massively complicated Ukrainian attempts to keep Bakhmut, the Ukrainian grouping in Bakhmut, supplied. But for what it's worth, the Daily Telegraph has in Britain has interpreted this as suggesting that the Russians might have actually blocked the last road into Bakhmut. Russian forces, are, this is the Daily Telegraph now, are blocking Ukrainian troops from getting in and out of the frontline area of Bakhmut, the Moscow Defence Ministry has said. And the Russian Defence Ministry said in a statement, airborne forces are providing support to advancing assault troops blocking the transfer of arm, Ukrainian army reserves to the city and the possibility of retreat from f for the enemy. And um, Prigozhin himself, by contrast, according to the Telegraph, has said that um, it's too early to say that the city has indeed been surrounded. Well, I, I'm not going to, as I said, judge on the full facts of this. It's clear to me that the Russians are indeed still pushing forward in Bakhmut. I think that it remains the case that resupply of the Ukrainian troops in Bakhmut is proving to be extremely difficult. And as I said, the, the Russians seem gradually, incrementally to be making progress there. Now, as I said, the one thing that the Russians have not done is closed, brought those two pincers together. There's no reports that they've yet captured Ivanivska or Orehovo Vasilyevka or um, Bogdanovka or um, Chromovo, all of these villages immediately to the west 
of Bakhmut. And a commentator, Yuri Podolyaka, who is originally of Ukrainian origin, but who has gone over to the Russian side and has become a major commentator on the Russian side about the war, and who seems to have extensive contacts um, on the front lines. Anyway, he said that the reason for this is that Ukraine has rushed more troops to try to hold positions in Bakhmut, and in particular to stop the pincers closing. There was an earlier report from Prigozhin that the pincers had not closed because the Russian military commanders decided that it would not be advantageous to do so, it would be too costly in lives, and that it works to Russian advantage to lure more Ukrainian troops in. Well, that's not quite what Podolyaka is saying, but he does say that Ukraine has rushed reinforcements, um, reinforcing, uh, replacing some of those 30,000 men that have been lost, that they're managing to cling on to their positions in these villages and to cling on to their positions in Bakhmut itself, though at the cost of very, very high losses. Now, how high those losses are, I'm not able to say. I did see one report, but again it came from a Russian source, that said that in the Bakhmut area, Ukraine is now experiencing losses of casualties of around 1,200 men a day. Now, only a fraction of those are uh, soldiers who are killed or very seriously wounded. So that would include, I presume, even more lightly, uh, lightly wounded soldiers as well. But it does give some sense of the intensity and ferocity of this particular battle. And the consensus amongst Russian commentators is that the fighting in Bakhmut has become so intense and Ukraine's commitment to holding Bakhmut remains so strong that Ukraine has had to deplete the forces that were being concentrated for the counteroffensive in Zaporozhye and redeploy troops from Zaporozhye and other areas to try to hold the line at Bakhmut and that this is the major reason why that counteroffensive in Zaporozhye is being postponed. And there are reports that it has been postponed until later, perhaps May, perhaps further still, into the early summer. These reports are coming from Ukrainian sources and, well, again, I can't say whether or not they are true or not. But we have had comments about this postponement of the Ukrainian offensive from uh, Vladimir Rogov, who is the head, or one of the heads of the Zaporozhye, the Russian-appointed Zaporozhye regional government. And he said, with respect to statements about, count, about a counteroffensive, any statements, uh, this is from the West or from Ukraine, any statements are propaganda information because the main purpose of the enemy is to confuse us by naming various times and dates, saying they are ready or not ready. Everyone plays their own game, so I wouldn't recommend to listen to, our, to or analyse their statements because it's meaningless information in which we could simply drown instead of doing our job. And um, this comment by... Um, Rogov was made directly after the Washington Post um, reported that Ukraine had decided to put off its counteroffensive, um, which um, because of poor weather um, and lack of ammunition. Well, actually, I take the reports that the counteroffensive has been postponed more seriously than Rogov does. I think it probably has been postponed. And I think that the major problem has been lack of ammunition. I think that even Ukrainian commanders have come to understand that trying to advance against heavily fortified Russian positions without 
artillery cover is folly. And I think that they've put back their offensive in the hope that they can get more shells from the European Union and from the United States. And perhaps it is not coincidence that there's just been a major deal done between the United States and South Korea, with South Korea agreeing to supply the United States with half a million shells, supposedly to deplete US arsenals of 155 55mm shells, which are said to be in a critical condition. And that may be part of what this is about, but I suspect that this is a complicated arrangement whereby South Korea says it's going to loan these shells to the United States in order to prevent these shells being sent to Ukraine, but the United States will then supply some of its own shells, some of its stock of remaining shells to Ukraine to try to make up the numbers. And I'm hearing, by the way, reports that the next arms package to Ukraine from the United States is going to be the very last one before the offensive takes place. And it will probably consist mostly of artillery shells. Nowhere near the number, I suspect, that the Russians have stockpiled, but at least more to enable Ukraine finally to launch this offensive. And that, of course, then brings us back to the perennial topic of what the prospects for this offensive are. And we've had all of those reports that were coming out over the last couple of days from all this big dump of papers that, the pe that have been leaked from the Pentagon. They give a, uh, a rather bleak picture of Ukrainian military formations still in the process of training. Some of them not getting as much training as they might need. Um, of um, equipment being provided to Ukraine by the West, but not perhaps in the numbers that would be needed to conduct an offensive of shortages in ammunition and of critical shortages in terms of air defence. And the air defence problem doesn't appear to have been resolved at all. It seems that Ukraine's ability to operate with uh, surface-to-air missiles, S-300s and book missiles, has, if not, has been if not entirely exhausted, then at least very heavily reduced. And for the record, I don't think these half million shells, even if all of them from South Korea go to Ukraine, which I doubt, by the way, or at least if the United States has enough half a million shells to send to Ukraine, Anyway, I don't think this is going to resolve Ukraine's ammunition problems. And of course, the European Union appears to have failed in its own project to supply Ukraine with shells. Now, of course, the importance of this cannot be overstated. Just a few weeks ago, Josip Borrell, the EU's... Um, High Representative for Foreign Affairs, it's the EU's Foreign Minister, if you like, was going around saying that unless Ukraine could be supplied with the shells it needed, then the war would end. The war would end, in other words, in a Russian victory. And the fact is that you, the EU has been unable to find the shells Ukraine needs, and the United States instead has had to rush off and try to find shells by pleading with South Korea. Now, I'm going to just make one quick observation on this issue of South Korea's supply of shells, something which the South Koreans apparently were very, very unwilling to do and probably will not agree to do again. I suspect that this has been a long, ongoing issue there's been this tantalising story, this, these constant reports about the Russians obtaining 152mm shells 
from North Korea. The North Koreans have categorically denied this. So have the Russians. The Russians deny that they have obtained shells from North Korea. And I am wondering now whether the reason for that story, which seems implausible, after all, President Lukashenko of Belarus has said that Russian shell production is now so, is now so high that Russia is no longer placing orders for 152 millimeter shells in Belarus, which it had previously um, been doing. But anyway, I wonder whether that story about North Korea providing shells to Russia wasn't intended to try to persuade or put pressure on the South Koreans to provide 155 millimeter shells in uh, large quantities to the United States. South Korea, by the way, has had good relations with Russia. Um, sometimes, until fairly recently, they were very good relations with Russia. It's also relied on Russia in the past to act as some kind of an interlocutor between South Korea and North Korea, passing messages between the two. And it's also looked to Russia to exercise some kind of restraint over North Korea. And of course, the South Koreans would not want to see a return to the situation which existed during the Cold War, where the Russians reverted to becoming North Korea's arms supplier and started to provide the North Koreans <clears throat> with sophisticated weapons such as fighter jets, which North Korea is currently short of. So it's completely understandable why the South Koreans would be unhappy at this US demand. But given South Korea's relationship with the United States, they could not simply reject it. Anyway, so that now brings me to um, a, further, um, a further point, which is uh, a further point of this, of this video, which is the state of the leadership of the United States, because there's been a most interesting article by Seymour Hirsch um, on his um, blog, his Substack blog. As it is behind a paywall, I'm not going to read it. But anyway, the, a summary of it would be as follows, that there is growing concern within some sections of the US intelligence community about what they see as the amateurism and lack of leadership, lack of effective really, uh, leadership shown by President Biden's leadership team. There is said to be particular exasperation with Secretary Blinken and National Security Advisor Sullivan. The one is seen as, that is to say, Blinken as nothing more than a congressional aide who has been wild, wildly over-promoted, far beyond his competence. The other, Sullivan, is seen more as a sort of political fixer than somebody who really understands or has much grasp of foreign policy. And there is also concern that Blinken and Sullivan see everything in pure black and white terms, that they're not really open to intelligent discussion about the situation or reasonable discussion about the situation, and that they're not really listening to any of the advice, any of the proper advice that they are being given by the intelligence professionals. There's also some degree of unhappiness about the quality of the military leaders of Austin and Milley. Um, Austin is clearly heavily involved in, with the Sullivan um, Blinken group. Um, as I said, he's not been perhaps <coughs> a member of the military for some time until he was appointed Defence Secretary. He's got very strong connections with the um, with Raython, 
I think to some extent he can be um, ignored for this purpose. But I do get the sense that there is a great deal of disappointment on the part of some people in the military and intelligence com community with General Milley. Or at least this is what Seymour Hirsch is telling us. We're told that Milley, way back in January, at a time when the situation for Ukraine was going very badly wrong in Bakhmut and other places, was so confident of Ukraine's victory that he actually tasked a group to draw up a surrender proposal for the Russians after Ukraine wins the battle on the battlefield. That does seem very bizarre, especially given the timing of this move in midwinter, when things for Ukraine were starting to go very, very seriously wrong. And I'm going to say this, I don't think that Milley is in fact quite as delusional about the situation in Ukraine as Seymour Hirsch or Seymour Hirsch's informant appeared to, appeared to think. I think the fundamental problem with Milley is that he's proved to be a highly political officer and though I think he understands at some level how difficult the situation for Ukraine is, he's after all made statements to this effect. Only a short, a few days ago, he was saying that Ukraine won't be able to regain all its territories this year, that it will be um, an extremely difficult thing for Ukraine to do. Anyway, um, I get the sense that Milly even as he says these things, doesn't want to break with Austin and doesn't want to confront the president. And I think that if I reading of this is correct, then I'm afraid that Milley um, is indeed abdicating his responsibilities, which is to tell truth to power. Um, the Prussians actually had an expression for this about the duty of a soldier to tell the truth to his king. And I think perhaps Milly is failing to some extent in that. And if so, I think this is tragic because I think that Milly is in fact in a better position than almost anybody else to bring this fighting to an end. If he were to come out and say straightforwardly to uh, President Biden, to people like Sullivan and Austin and um, Blinken, that the war cannot be won, then I think that might actually have an effect. And his persistent failure to do so has played a major role in setting us up for this crisis in Ukraine, which we're going to see in the summer. Now, I remain of my view, all the indications suggest that the Russians are now fully prepared for this offensive. They've been told about it for months, that they built up huge fortified lines. There's been a more recent report that the Russians are still fortifying their lines in the south. They're still building new trenches, new barriers, making it more, more, more and more difficult for the Ukrainians to advance. And we've also seen, as I've said before, increased activity from the Russian Air Force. They're carrying out more and more bombing strikes um, in Ukraine using these precision-guided glide bombs and... Apparently, production of these glide bombs has increased markedly, and obviously they're being increasingly used, taking the place of the more expensive missiles that were being used before. And that doesn't mean, by the way, that a missile attack isn't coming. I suspect that we're going to get one probably at some point within the next few days. But anyway, we'll come to that fairly soon. So there we are. That's the situation on the battlefronts in Ukraine. Uh, 
the Russians still pushing hard in Bakhmut. The Ukrainians still trying to cling on to this place, um, losing enormous numbers of men in the process. The Russians, by the way, still saying that they're making more progress in Abdeevka. They're claiming that they, they succeeded in blocking some more of the roads leading into Avdeevka. There's no suggestion that Avdeevka is fully surrounded. But anyway, the major battle zone remains Bakhmut. And in the meantime, preparations for this offensive continue, though I do think it's been postponed, though I suspect that it will be launched at some point, perhaps in May, rather than April, once these shells, which have either arrived from South Korea or been re released to the United States, enabling the United States to send shells of its own, a shell game, if you like. Um, anyway, once these shells finally arrive in Ukraine, and we will see what happens, and we will see how it turns out. Now, some months ago, I said that all this, all these preparations about, over this offensive bear some resemblance to me of what I've led, read about the Battle of Kursk in 1943 during the, on the Eastern Front, the war between the Soviets and the Germans. The Germans planned a spring offensive in a place called Kursk, which, by the way, is not that far from these battlefields. Um, the Soviets got wind of it through their intelligence agencies. They found out where the location of the attack was going to be. They built up enormously heavy fortified lines. They reinforced their forces there. They decided that rather than go on the offensive themselves, they would wait for the Germans to launch their attack. They would grind the German offensive down on these fortifications. And then, once the Germans had been ground down, then, of course, they would launch a devastating counterattack of their own. And that, by the way, is how the Battle of Kursk actually shaped out. It was a tremendous battle, fought in 1943, in the summer of 1943, in July 1943, to be precise. Um, we're approaching its anniversary. <laughs> um, and... Um, the Germans did launch their much-delayed offensive in July 1943. It did crash onto very heavily fortified Soviet positions. The Germans did lose enormous losses. The Soviets did counterattack. And that counterattack was the single event which conclusively gave the Russians the initiative on the Eastern Front. From that moment on, the Russians basically never looked back. Now, I'm not suggesting in any way that the battle that's going to take place in Ukraine over the next few months is going to be like Kursk. It's not going to have that enormous scale. Of course, the actors are quite different. If, if it is a battle of Kursk, it will be a battle, of course, in miniature. And, of course, the casualties that will be inflicted will be, thankfully, on a far lesser scale. But, as I said, Russians are some Russian commentators are already making these parallels, which I myself made some months ago. I've started to see them appear. Battle of Kursk II. And one can understand why. Because even though the wars are very different and the armies are very different and much smaller this time, one can see that the philosophy that the Russians seem to be following is very much the same. Don't go on the offensive yet. Build up your forces. Increase your reserves increase your stockpiles of ammunition, build up these enormous fortifications, wait for the enemy to come, 
bleed the enemy dry on these fortifications and then launch your counterattack. Will it work? Will it work for the Ukrainians? Will it work for the Russians? Well, time will tell, but I have to say straightforwardly that my own view is that the odds increasingly favour the Russians. The leak of all of those Pentagon documents suggests that and suggests that people in Washington, at least, understand that. Um, Seymour Hersh's latest piece on Substack says exactly the same, that people are becoming increasingly concerned in Washington that the leadership group around the president, Sullivan, Blinken, Austin, even Milley, aren't listening or paying any attention to the information and the briefings that they're being given, and that there's growing exasperation and concern about this. Well, as I said, we will see what happens, and we will see how the war turns out. And as I said, these people who are trying to carry out these briefings appear to see things in much the same way as I do. Anyway, that is where we are, or so it seems to me, today with the war in Ukraine. Now, there are lots of other things going on around the world. And still, I think the most important is the visit by President Lula of Brazil to China. Now, this visit had to be postponed because Lula fell ill and um, he's now apparently been able to come. And I gather that he's intending to stay in China for five days. And importantly, it seems that at Chinese, China's request, Ukraine is not going to be high on the agenda of this meeting. Instead, what Brazil and China are going to do is that they're going to forge ahead with their economic relationship. In other words, Brazil and China, both members of the BRICS, are working to reactivate the B part of the BRICS. Under the previous uh, Brazilian president, President Bolsonaro, um, Brazil became less engaged in the BRICS than it had previously been. There was a lot of speculation when President Lula won the election about what he would do. Many felt that he had strong connections with the United States and with the Democratic Party. I did point out that he had also, however, been one of the founding members of the BRICS. And I thought it most unlikely that he would turn it, turn completely his back on the BRICS. I thought, on the contrary, that he was more likely to want to revive Brazil's role in the BRICS. And that's exactly, it seems, what he's intending to do. He's going to China. He's going to agree all sorts of economic contacts, trade contacts between China and Brazil. And importantly, the plan is apparently to start trading in currencies other, other than the dollar. In other words, Brazil and China will no longer be using the dollar to the same extent in their trade with each other. And this is now a gathering trend. It is happening in more and more places around the world. And of course, it isn't just the dollar, because as more and more countries start to opt out of the SWIFT interbank payment system, as they're increasingly starting to do. Well, maybe not opt out of it entirely, but in any event, limit its use. As they are increasingly exploring alternatives, like the Russian system, the Chinese system, those sort of systems, the United States starting to lose track of financial flows, of global financial flows. Up to now, through, its, through the dollar and through SWIFT, it's known where money was moving around the world. 
at any one time, doesn't seem to have that ability to gather that information for very much longer. And China and Brazil opting out of the dollar system is every bit as consequential. In fact, in some respects, it's even more consequential than China and Russia doing so. Because Brazil remains, in theory at least, in good standing with the United States. It's not directly involved in the Ukrainian conflict. And the fact that it nonetheless has decided, as a BRICS member state, to use local currencies, to, to use its own currency and the Chinese currency to trade, shows that this isn't just China and Russia because of the particular nature of the relationships between those two countries, or Russia and India because India needs to use local currencies because of the way in which Russia has been sanctioned. It is China and Brazil, Brazil a country that has not been sanctioned, electing to do this of their own choice. And as I say, this is a very consequential move and of course it will have major consequences for the future. And on the topic of Ukraine, it seems that the Brazilians are still hoping to agree with the Chinese some sort of joint statement uh, which will reaffirm essentially the Chinese perspectives on how this conflict should be resolved. And of course, Brazil is clear that it will not supply ammunition to Ukraine. So, Brazil, China, and there is another equally important meeting taking place, and that is, that is the visit of the Syrian foreign minister to Saudi Arabia. Now, a few weeks ago, China brokered a rapprochement between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And that was came as something of a shock to the um, international system. It was something of a diplomatic revolution. It completely changed the mood in the Middle East. And then we've seen increasing moves by Turkey and Syria to find a way to resolve their differences as well. But more important than that is the visit of the Syrian foreign minister to Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia was one of the countries that led in the attempt to overthrow President Assad, um, and which participated heavily in the support of the insurgency against him. Well, they've now changed their policy They've now received President Assad's foreign minister in Saudi Arabia, in Riyadh, and apparently President Assad himself is going to be invited to the next meeting of the Arab League so that um, Syria will finally be able to rejoin the Arab League from which it was expelled when the conflict in Syria began 10 years ago. So this is another diplomatic revolution. But perhaps the further point to make about it is that, once again, it's a further sign of defiance by Saudi Arabia of the United States. A few, about a week ago, we saw reports, reports began to appear that US CIA director uh, William Burns had gone to Saudi Arabia, that he met Saudi officials there, that he'd expressed he, the US's frustration about the fact that Saudi Arabia was um, improving relations with countries like Iran and Syria. And of course, coming from the CIA director in over the course of what was supposed to be a secret visit, that wasn't so much an expression of frustration it was and would have been perceived in Saudi Arabia as a warning or even as a threat that the United States is not happy 
with these moves that the Saudis are making and wants to see them ended. And if they're not ended, then Saudi Arabia will face not just criticism, but pressure from the United States. Well, the Saudis have now given their answer. They have disregarded this warning from William Burns. They have welcomed Syria's foreign minister in Saudi Arabia. So, there we go. A political leadership in Washington that Seymour Hersh tells us his sources are becoming increasingly exasperated with, that they see um, this group of people, Lincoln, Sullivan, the others, as out of touch, deluded, over-ideological, with a tendency to see the world in pure black and white terms, unwilling to um, entertain compromise, unwilling to engage in proper diplomacy, willing to tell lies, that's another point that this article by Seymour Hersh says, that they're willing to lie, not just to deny things, but to actually go out straightforwardly and tell flat-out lies as part of their moral crusade. All of these things. Um, and we see the increasing effect that this is having around the world. Countries like China and Brazil prefer to deal with each other and to bypass this group in Washington, whom they can't trust. We see the Saudis absolutely exasperated with the lectures that they're getting from this group in Washington and deciding instead to make peace with their regional enemies, the Iranians, the Syrians, and by the way, apparently also with the Houthis in Yemen. And of course, this particular group of people, their bizarre sets of illusions are what lies at the base, at the foundation, are the foundational cause for the crisis we have in Ukraine, for the war that is taking place there. So, all together, the world is moving on, even as Washington and Kiev, and London, and Brussels fret and worry and agonize about this Ukrainian counteroffensive. With the United States going with a begging bowl to its South Korean allies, trying to get them to provide shells of which the United States, the country that once prided itself on being the arsenal of democracy is short and which it cannot produce in the numbers it needs to satisfy its needs. Well, there we go. Well, that's me for the day. Um, I am back in London. My house is still in, well, it's something of a Shall we say it's a work in progress? The rewiring is still nowhere near completed. Um, um, but I will continue to make programmes to keep you updated on events as I understand them. And in the meantime, um, thank you for joining me today. More from me soon. Uh, no doubt more information about Bakhmut and other places there shortly. And just to remind you again, you can find all our programmes on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble, BitChute, Odyssey, Rockfin, and Telegram. You can support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar, links under this video. You can also check out our shop, find the great things that you will find there on magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our t-shirts, our sweatshirts, all of those great, th all of those great things. And last but not least, um, if you've liked this video, please remember to press the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. Thank you for joining me again today. More from me soon.